So uh, today we're gonna pick up um, off pick up where we left off uh, before the break. And does anyone remember what was that? What were we doing before the break? Coverage. Yeah, coverage test. And I wanna go through and review just a couple items of this because the break was long and uh, it's easy to forget some of the stuff. But also because the material that I'm going to be drawing on today is going to, it's, it's going to really benefit you if, if you have in mind some of the items uh, from this uh, earlier lecture at a high level. Okay. Um, so I noted that the coverage goes on in, in many forms. And last time we, we took a look at these uh, state-based and transition coverage. Today we're going on to, to prime path um, coverage. And I noticed that coverage testing involves abstracting your program at some level, making a program, zooming up from the details, and envisioning it um, at a higher level. Hides a lot of details, but um, captures some basic features of the situation. And what we talked about last time, and today it's going to continue, is envisioning your system as a set of nodes, that is vertices, and edges, or transitions. And I noticed that you can. I noted that you can do this at different levels. So you can, you can do this at the high level of your program, sort of characterizing the functional states it can go through, the, the web pages that your web app can go through, or the screens of your your app. Um, you can envision a program like that, and these transitions might be things based on user input or particular conditions that come up during that processing. That's one way to envision things. Um, it could also be done at the lower level with statements, and basic blocks, sets of code that kind of execute together or not at all. And here we have, again, vertices and edges. But the edges mean different things. They're, they're based on conditions in the code, for example, right? We talked about both those sort of levels at which you could envision parts of your program or the, or the system as a whole. Um, now, this is one of the things I wanted you to remember most notably. And it's the type of thing which typically gets into the exam. Um, what are the three key steps in, in um, Code cover in co and coverage procedures. I think this is a question most students get wrong. Often I get blank. Um, hard, hard to, hard for students to give. Easy for me to mark, unfortunately. <laughs> but my heart sinks. Um, so, so don't, don't, uh, don't miss out on this thing. Okay. So the three basic steps are to identify the set of things you need to cover. Maybe you want to cover nodes. You want to cover, or you want to cover transitions, maybe. Or maybe you want to cover prime paths, as we'll talk about today. Mm -hmm. so, so identify them, okay, um, within this graph. Mm -hmm. Next, you develop a set of abstract scenarios that include all the things you want to want to cover. Now, these scenarios will need to go, need to be need to be things that are in fact realizable. So going from start to finish is a very is a very common um, component of that. So to go from start to finish. So you can you can you can pass through them. And then you develop a set of concrete test cases that actually cover all of these things, all these abstract scenarios. Now a given abstract scenario, given path from start to finish, you know, which might have loops in it or whatever, might be covered, one of those might be covered by test case, or a test case might cover several of those, in fact. Um, it goes through the program enough that it's actually covering covering several, okay? Um, and uh, these concrete test cases, the key thing that's gonna be going on here is you're gonna need to ask about what particular input is going to exercise 
these scenarios. I mean, the, the abstract scenarios are defined in terms of paths through the program. But to make that happen within your program, you're going to need concrete test cases to make it go this way rather than that way, right? Um, maybe your scenario involves reaching a place in the code that's only associated with rebalancing of a red black tree, something like that. Um, or it's associated with responding to a network timeout. There's some you know, piece of your code. Or maybe it's based on an error screen of your app when it's offline and, and it can upload things that user needs to get a message that warns them when they try to submit something. Right? Right? So those scenarios will sometimes involve things that are not common. And in order to exercise that scenario, you need to come up with a specific test case that will actually make that happen. You come up with a very careful case involving the tree that will cause rebalancing. Boom. Right? Um, or you come up with, with a case of looking in a data structure for something that's not there. You know, you, so you capture that case. Or you look up for something in a data structure where the, the item is the last item in the, you know, that's, that's found or what have you. Um, so you have to come up with test cases that are clever. And a lot of work is involved in kind of going from the abstract scenarios to the test cases. So, you know, you want to, let's, let's, uh, uh, let's, let's go through this. Um, so, you know, if you want to, here's this CGI decoder, right? It, it went and it, um, it turned in, um, it basically is taking a, a, a URL type string with pluses for space and, and um, dot with percent signs and, and hexadecimal numbers to encode um, a values outside certain common ranges. Here, um, we have different conditions to handle different things, like if it's a percent sign um, or if it's a plus, right? Um, we are going to have to consider uh, these possibilities that, um, you know, we we're going to have a possibility to handle a plus, and so we need to have a test case that includes a plus to get to E, right? We're not going to get to E unless somewhere we have a plus. It's only under that condition that we go to E, block E, right? So we need it. We're going to ultimately need a test case that has a plus in order to cover to reach E, or to reach here um, G. We need something that is a percent sign, right? Um, and uh, in those cases, we're going to, to reach those cases, we need to, to have a particular set of inputs. So, so it may be, for example, that to achieve a certain degree of testing, we'll need test cases like those, those here. These are concrete test cases that we would feed into this system to get it to exercise a certain degree of coverage, okay? And looking at that, all of those are legit test cases for reaching, I believe, all blocks here. So you'll notice that they're not all the same, right? Would we expect these to be all the same? No, look, we could come up with many, many separate sets of little tests, sets of strings that if we consider them collectively, they force it to come in here. I mean, you could have many different particular URLs. You notice, like test four here, this achieves block coverage, but it does so with a single string. Hmm? It achieves block coverage, but it does so with a string. How, how is that possible? How is that possible? Exactly. So, so in different parts of it, it's forcing it to one block or another. So there's your plus. It's forcing it here to E. With after that, you know, here's the percent uh, 
percent, uh, and K is forcing, forcing, forcing it over to this uh, to this path here. Lots of cases where it's going to F. So it just keeps on looping back and looping back until it covers all these blocks, and then it it's, it's done and, and it's happy. By contrast, this first one this consists of a set of discrete cases. Um, so one with something that's just an uh, URL consisted of a single space, one which is purely text, and another which includes both. The point is you can achieve test coverage with different test cases, but coming up with these test cases requires thought. And that, that's the sort of thing I'm looking you know, for you to provide increasingly, and ID3 is going to be a, a great place. I'm going to be wanting to know what, what are your test cases? What are your things... What are the concrete things you're going to be doing that are going to get you to this point? I think I've seen some of that already that you've handed in, but it's, it's a good thing to cover more. By contrast, something like this, if I wanted to reach these points, I'd be working out very specific cases that will do this. Again, I remember John Nick working on this and on the Excel project, and he had to come up with Excel spreadsheets that would get it, you know, to hit one block or hit another. So we'd set it up very delicately so that there was a circular reference here, or we'd set it up so that, you know, these cells depended on these two, which depended on a common cell or something like that, just to make sure it was hitting all, all the right places, right? Does that make sense for test cases? You set up these very specific circumstances to get it to go here or to get it to you know, make this loop once and then and then come out or whatever. You have to really think creatively about, okay, what test case is going to exercise this in order to achieve that coverage, in order to achieve that, that sort of hitting those cases. So if you get, you know, 70% test coverage and you're hoping to bring it up, you're going to want to think about, okay, how are we going to get it to reach this area of my code? and you're gonna come up with test cases that hopefully will do that. Sometimes those tests, those uh, reaching certain paths, reaching certain places here, may require very specific conditions, like the network times out, right? Or the disk is full, or the, you know, there's a, um, a URL that can't be reached, or, or what have you. Um, that it's misformed, uh, contents of a file. So how are you going to get it to, to hit those things for cases like that? T take a case of a network timeout or a disk error or, you know, a um, disk fault. How are you going to get it to reach those places? Use mocking. You use mocking. It's exactly it. It's exactly it. So you use some sort of, of mocking. Um, I talked earlier about test hooks, which um, are another way to achieve that, where you basically set, maybe maybe you s tell it essentially internally, okay, pretend like this condition went on in order to get it to, to reach this certain place. But mocking is one of the best ways to do it. Mocking is a sort of very, very nice way to do it. So you mock out a component, the component indicates, um, hey, there's been a timeout, and now it has to be handled by the code. So you you build the program in a way that allows for testability, allows for itself to be tested. That's part of getting it to reach those places. Um, maybe you have a variable that actually you test. You know, if this is a timeout or this condition occurs to simulate timeout, you know, you go here, and then by flipping that, you can you can exercise that code to see if the timeout handler is correct, right? Pretty, pretty straightforward idea. I mentioned this idea of testability early on. Programs are enhanced if by, they're made more testable by having specifications, having these statements of what code does, by, by having in place mocking frameworks, having a scripting language that will drive the program. Those are all really good things, having these test hooks that can set the internal state as if this error has occurred or, or you know, allow you to kind of look internally to see if it's, um, 
it's uh, if a certain condition has occurred. Um, these are all ways programs can be made more testable um, so that we know what's going on. Another big one, which I'll be looking for a big way for ID3, is assertions. Assertions, ladies and gentlemen. Why do assertions help testability? They check your assumptions, and if your assumptions off are off, they help spot it as soon as possible. So if something goes wrong, hopefully it's caught much closer to the source and, and sooner, and or it's more likely to be caught at all if you know about it, rather than it just being silent but deadly. So this is th these are cases where you know you might want to litter your code <coughs> with with assertions in order to to verify certain certain. Um, conditions are holding, and if they don't, uh, the assertions will be triggered. So all ways for, for testability. And certainly, there's ways in which some of those testable strategies directly impact this, um, this coverage testing. Okay, so just going through this um, a little bit more, we have all these different ways of sort of taking a scenario or taking a real-world set of, of uh, conditions or designs of our program and turning it into a representation of, of state, okay? Now I noticed, I had noted last time that there are subsumption relationships that occur here within this code. Subsumption in the sense that if we have, if we have mechanisms that are, that are cheap, or if we achieve a certain level of coverage on one, and then it's below another thing here, that means anything we can that we, we uh, get by covering edge coverage also gives us node coverage. It's strictly stronger than, edge cover is strictly stronger than, than node coverage. So a little bit like the subsumption relationships you probably, you folks have hopefully heard about in 360 or 364, right? Anything you can do with a Turing machine, excuse me, uh, if, you, if you achieve so anything you can do with a regular expression, you can do with a pushdown automata. Anything you can do with a pushdown automata, you can do with a Turing machine. But there are some things you can do with a Turing machine you're never going to be able to do with a pushdown automata. And same thing with pushdown automata compared to a regular, uh, uh, what's achieved with uh, regular expressions or finite state automata. They're, um, they're, they're sort of dual. OK. Um, so last time we talked about state coverage, and state coverage is kind of the simplest and weakest criteria. And, and hey, it gets us somewhere. Uh, Cobertura, for example, gives you state coverage by default, I believe. Um, but the problem is it's kind of weak. It's weak because there's a lot of cases in our code where bugs come up, defects are present, only if you reach certain places within that code, right? Only if you reach a certain place. Only if you go a certain way through the code does the problem come up. So here we have a pointer that's originally null under a certain condition. We exercise, we assign to that pointer. And maybe you think the code is such that this point, maybe it's in a loop around this if, and. This will always be hit at least once, and only later you write to it. But maybe there are some cases where it's never hit, right? Never gets hit. And as a result, you know, this, this assignment can be through a null pointer below, the dereference assignment through p hat. So you could have state coverage here. It could hit all these states um, uh, at, at some point, but still not uncover the fact that you could get a null pointer exception, okay? So you achieve state coverage, but you don't achieve a path, which might be possible, where, you know, in fact, you can, uh, uh, where, in fact, this, this null pointer occurs, because you're not trying to capture cases where this if is not hit. You're not trying to figure out, okay, how do we make it so this if is false? Um, to achieve that, you're going to need a higher level of coverage, namely transition coverage. Transition coverage is you're exercising all transitions at least once, right? All edges. There's one edge where 
if is true, and there's one edge where it's false. And you'll, you'll, to achieve transition coverage, in contrast to state coverage, you would need to make it so that you try it once when it's true, and then you also have one which tries it when it's false, right? Yeah? Hello? Yeah? Is that right? Yeah, okay, good. Um, uh, so, so transition coverage is stronger than edge coverage. And frankly, in, in the software development context, it's often it's a really important type of strength because testing, testing gaps are commonly there. Defects are often occurring under certain paths and not others. So at least you achieve uh, transition coverage gives you extra confidence. So here, you know, uh, we are achieving transition coverage by by going through multiple different pathways. So we cancel a ticket, for example, before it's actually ticketed, or, or we cancel it after it's ticketed. Um, we're not just going once to the canceled state, we're going with each of these paths. By contrast, this is state coverage. With state coverage, okay, we're at least we're trying cancellation by something, but we've never actually tested whether a refund works correctly. That's pretty weak, right? Never done this refund. How do we know that refunds work properly? Well, to achieve that, we're going to be going with transition coverage. Okay. Um, so, you know, here, um, just this certain path, and zero and one and two is enough to achieve node coverage. You know, whereas here, for, for transition coverage, we need to, we need to have two types of pass through. Yes, and zero and one and two is one. That's great. But we also need n zero and two, right? Yeah. So okay. in this case, edge case is the same as transition coverage, right? Edge, edge coverage is the same as edge. I'm using the terms edge coverage and transition coverage the same. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. They, are, they are two different ways in which we, we talk about things. This is actually from, oh my god. Why isn't it? OK, sorry. This is Amin and Ofut's book. Um, I got to get that in there. Um, this is Amin and Opit's book, and, and they tend to use the term ant edge coverage. Others use the term transition coverage. Okay. Just, just like some people call nodes versus vertices. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so, uh, right. Um, so, uh, lower level and higher level. Um, code testing is, is worthwhile. In your, in your uh, projects, ladies and gentlemen, I think it would be admirable if for core algorithms you, you uh, achieve focused coverage at the level of, of, of uh, transition coverage would be amazing. What I do want to see from you folks is two big things. Number one, coverage statistics of some sort, at least at a node level, that is statement or, or node coverage uh, from tools like Cobertura or choose, choose your own, a JS blanket is another one for JavaScript, et cetera. I want to see that. It's very important. The second thing I want to see is I do want to see for your high level designs through the program, your pages or your app screen or what have you, You're, I want to see uh, at least transition level of coverage by the end of the semester. Okay? Um, that will make me really, really happy. Um, and uh, I don't necessarily expect you to achieve, achieve uh, you know, transition coverage at the level of statements, et cetera. Um, the level of sort of paths through the small program. Now, if you have a core algorithm, if there's an algorithm in there that's a central one, sure, achieving some level of statement coverage on that is fantastic, or, or, or transition coverage on that is fantastic. But, you know, I wouldn't expect it uh, throughout your entire program. But I would want to see the functional, functional level. Okay, um, so this brings us this kind of little review clarification of expectations brings us to this to this next point which is um, 
we've gone no, no to an ad coverage, but we need to start thinking more, more thoroughly uh, than that. And one is sort of pairs of edges, ladies and gentlemen. Transition tuple. This is edge pair. So here, maybe we can achieve, for example, uh, edge coverage. Well, we can achieve edge coverage with B, D, E, and C, D, F, for example. Every one of those edges is covered somewhere, right? But we've never, if, if we just use those paths, B, D, E, C, D, F, we actually have never experienced a situation where we've gone B, D, F, and maybe that causes problems. Or maybe C, D, E, for example, causes problems. So with transition pair, or edge pair coverage, we'd be doing you know, all pairs of, of, of edges um, here, coming in, going out. Um, that would be stronger than edge coverage. After all, if we have edge coverage, we, we, we certainly have had edge pair coverage. Um, but, but as it turns out, we're going to talk about something that's stronger than that, and that's called prime path coverage. Okay, so we're going to go through and give a notion of prime paths. We will give a notion of simple paths as sort of a step towards prime paths, and we'll take a look at an algorithm that gives us prime paths, just given a graph. Okay. Um, Prime paths, prime path coverage is in a somewhat distinguished position here um, in that it actually is covering strictly more than edge pair and also then it's called complete round trip coverage and another form of coverage called uh, all definition use pair coverage. Okay, so I'm going to give definition here and I'll try to bring up a little bit of intuition with this. So, we're going to be characterizing prime paths, building on a, a definition that's simpler than that. And, and the definition of the thing that's simpler is of a simple path. Okay. So suppose we have a a graph here, and and we'll we'll just draw this out here. Okay. Um, and uh, I'll draw it down like like this. Um, We'll talk about a simple path from node A to node B um, if it does not include any repeated nodes, except possibly the start can be the same as the thing. So let me give you a simple path here, okay? One simple path would be, and I'll, I'll, I'll list it out here, two, three, I'm gonna draw links between here um, that are applied, okay? So two, Three, four, five, six, two. That's a simple path. Okay, um, it's from two to two, so A and B is actually the same, uh, the same here, and it contains no repeated nodes except for and it's optional two. That's a simple path. It consists of going once around this loop, coming back. And then be oh sorry what am, what am I doing where's one there's one okay um, another simple path incidentally would be two three <coughs> that's a simple path what would not be a simple path give me something that's not a simple path first of all it has to be a path you have to be going from between connected points you can you know two six is not a path because there's no edge directly from that right. So, so there's certain things that are not simple paths just because they're not paths at all. But give me something that's a path but not a simple path with this. Okay, two, three, four, three, two. Okay, yeah. Um, okay, that w has repetition of more than just the beginning and end, right? Um, yeah, I am actually going to uh, draw, I should probably have clarified this here. This is directed, so I should have um, drawn this here. These are 
directed edges. There we go. Um, so, um, you know, if I had made that clear earlier, uh, we could have ruled it out because of that, but uh, I didn't. So yes, that would be a problematic path. Give me another path that is not a simple path, but it is a path. Yeah. Two, three, four, seven, eight. That actually is a simple path, believe it or not. Because two, three, four, seven, eight, um, it's from a node A, two, to a node B, eight, and it contains no repeated nodes. It doesn't go, it doesn't have any repetition. Um, it also doesn't have 2 and 8 being the same, but that's optional, okay? So, so 2, 3, 4, 7, 8 actually does qualify as a simple path. But give me another one that does not. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4. Good, yeah. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3... The fact, the fact that it went beyond repeating the first one and going on to repeating later ones, that's the problem. It had two, and not just two, but three present, and maybe four uh, repeated. Okay, um, so that's, that's good. That's, that's an encouraging one. I'm going to put a zero up here. I'm going to put a zero. Suppose we had 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1. Would that be legit? No. Bad news, because it had only one repeat in it, 1, but we were at, it didn't start with 1. It started with 0, so that's actually not a simple path. It's a path, but it's not a simple path, because it, it repeated something that was not the beginning. Mm -hmm. Didn't go to back to its beginning and stop or not return at all. So those are simple paths. Do pe are people starting to feel comfortable with that? And it's a simple path. Okay. Um, the idea is going to be we can, we can build up paths out of simple paths. Okay. Um, um, okay. Um, another notion is a prime path. Okay, this is the more important notion. So all prime paths are simple paths. Okay, um, but there's a further criteria. A prime path within a graph has a further distinguishing characteristic. It's a simple path, but it's one that's not contained as a subpath of any other simple path. It's kind of like a maximum size simple path. Maximum size simple path that doesn't contain any repetition of loop. Kind of it's as big as you can get without having this kind of repetition as part of it, or at least, an, 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 yeah, not having this, this repetition as part of it, okay? Um, so here, it's a prime path, it's one of these guys, but it further has this constraint that it's, it's, it's not a, a sub-piece of, of any other. Okay, so here's some examples. Oh, I, you know, I should, uh, I should actually ask you to do this. So here we go. Let's, let's, uh, let's try, okay, this is going to be a hard, a hard slog. Okay, what am I going to do to cover these? Here, uh, there we go. Um, <laughs> yeah, the old, old technologies. Um, man, I've got to do better than this. Um, okay, um, great. Uh, <laughs> okay, so give me, for the one on the left, um, uh, give me the, give me some prod paths within this. N0, N1, N3. Good. That's a prime path. Is it a simple path? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's certainly a path, and it's also a simple path because it doesn't have any repetition to disqualify itself, right? 
so that's that's good. Um, give me is are that all of the prime paths, sir? No. No. What else is the prime path? And zero and two and three. Yeah, and two and zero and two and three. So that's that's good. Those are those are some prime paths here. Okay, now I have a less hard job here. Um, okay, so um, what? How about this one on the right? Okay, a zero, so this is, and zero at the top, and one, and then up to the upper right of it, and three, and four, and this is n two at the bottom. And zero, and one, and three, and four. And zero, and one, and three, and four. So the question is, is that a path? Yes, it is. It's a prime path, rather. It's a prime path. Why can't it include n one? Oh, if, we think it could. Actually, couldn't it? Uh, no. Not the end of the start, yeah. so that's why, and that's why it can't get any bigger, and that's why it's not contained as a subset of any other prime path. If there were one bigger than it, then included the subset, it would have to include n one as well, which, which, you know, is not then a legitimate prime path. Mm -hmm. Give me another one that's a prime path for the one on the right here. Okay, yeah, and zero and one and two, uh, ab absolutely. Um, could could there be something even bigger that contains that? Not a simple path, no. Yeah, it's, it's not going to be a simple path then, um, because it's not going to contain. It's it's not going to contain n one only 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 once, right? If, if something started at N1, it could go around to N1, but then it won't contain N2. If it started at N0, it can't even go around to contain N1 again, and then it couldn't contain N2. So, so this is, that, that's a, a maximum size one. In fact, there's quite a few, so you listed some of them. N0, N1, N2 here, N0, N1, N3, N4. Uh, would be another one, I think it was mentioned, yeah. Um, but then there are some which, you know, you didn't mention because maybe you thought it wasn't allowed, but uh, it actually is. I mean, with, there's nothing with the notion of prime paths that says you have to start at the start here. So here, N1, N3, N4, for example, N1, that's, that's actually a prime path. It's not contained in any other prime path as a subpath of another prime path. It starts at N1, N3, N4, N1. There's no other one that can contain it because something that started at N0 wouldn't be able to continue on after uh, to, to N1 the second time. And if it started at N1, and we do N3, N4, N1, and it continued on to N2, that would be illegal too, because then it wouldn't be a repetition of the first and last. So that's, that's the largest uh, size. Uh, that's a prime path as well. Um, now, uh, here, these are a listing of, of the prime paths. Uh, we can, now the, the interesting thing is, if we consider both the one on the left and the right here, we can achieve coverage of prime paths here without needing separate cases for all of those. So let's consider this one on the right here. Here, we are going to actually have these two cases that will be needed to cover it. There's no two ways about it that we can't have one test case here that's gonna go on the left one, or in one scenario that's going the left one, one scenario that's going the right one. That, those are what's needed. It, one scenario is not going to cover all of them, right? On the right hand side, there can be, we can actually cover all of these with just one scenario from the start to the finish. And zero and one and two, that's one scenario. And another scenario that would, uh, would cover it would be 
uh, that, that collectively will cover it, and zero and one and three and four and one, and yes, we could go around for another loop and three and four and one and two, okay? And you'll notice here that, that actually that latter one actually um, does not include the former one. Why do I say that? It doesn't include the former one. So the, this latter one, why does it include the first? Directly. It includes all of the nodes, but it doesn't include the yeah. That's exactly right. It includes the nodes, yeah, and, and zero and one and two are all part of the second one, but it doesn't include the sequence of nodes, right? Doesn't include that sequence of nodes. So it's it's not a merely a kind of duplicate of, of the first. Um, but I would argue that those two collectively, therefore, contain all of these prime paths. The second one actually contains all but that first. It doesn't contain the first, which is, then I'll point it out. I mean, this first one, and zero, and one, and two, is not contained in the second one, because there's no n zero, n one, n two in that sequence. But the second one, this, this one, n zero, and one, and three, and four, and one, and three, and four, and one, and two, that contains all these other guys. All of these others. For example, it contains n1, n2, and 3 and 1. That's contained in this in the second one. So is n4, n1, n3, n4, which was uh, this one here. That that's also contained in the second one. That's why it went around the loop twice. Hmm? You may think, well, why does it have to go around the loop twice? Because to achieve prime path coverage, to cover all of the prime paths, it has to go around this loop twice. So let me, just, just in case you're you know, having trouble getting your, your head around this, let me go back to this testable point. So here, ladies and gentlemen, we're identifying the set of things we need to cover. What are the set of things we're covering? Prime paths. Good. Good call. Good call. Prime paths. Those are the things we're trying to cover. Second of all, we, d we develop a set of abstract scenarios through those prime paths that will cover those prime paths. Right? These are the set of scenarios that are going to, the set of scenarios that are going to cover these prime paths are those highlighted in red. Right? These are the ones that will cover these prime paths. So we've identified the prime paths, but that doesn't mean there's a test case for each. It doesn't mean there's a scenario for each. There's two scenarios that collectively, they go from start to finish, and they collectively cover all those prime paths. So we're gonna have those scenarios. Those are the abstract scenarios we figured out. And then we're gonna need to figure out test cases particular inputs, particular situations set up with the variables involved or what have you, or particular types of user input into the system that are going to exercise these two test scenarios, right? Now, so let me ask this. These are very, again, very testable questions. So is this longer of the two elements in red on the right hand side there. Is that longer one a itself a prime path? No, it's not a prime path. Is it covering prime paths? Yes. Yeah, it's covering prime paths. So these abstract scenarios are not the same things necessarily as what you're trying to cover. Just I mean abstract scenarios not are not the statements themselves. There are a sequence of going through there that will cover the statements you're trying to cover, or, or the transitions, or the prime paths you want to cover. So first, you identify what you want to cover, statements, or transitions, or prime paths. Step one, you, just, you, you identify them. Step two, 
to identify abstract scenarios that will cover those things. Those scenarios are not necessarily, you know, the types of things you want to cover. They're not statements. They're not just transitions. They are not simply prime paths. These are scenarios from start to finish. Mm -hmm. Trying to figure out a way, okay, how are we going to cover these prime paths? We've got to make scenarios from start to finish that will cover them. These two cover them. But they're not prime paths themselves. That's fine. They're just they're covering the prime paths. That's the whole point. One of the scenario covers multiple prime paths. That's fine. But it's a scenario that we're going to take, and then we've got to figure out how we're going to get it to go that way. How, what sort of input is going to need it to be there? What sort of contents have to be in the database? What sort of user input are they going to put in via the web form that will get it to go around this loop in those two ways, right? And then the, scenario, then the testers will try to make that happen, either manually, in person, We'll say I ran this test that got it to go around, or, or through uh, an automated little script that will drive it through this way. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Coverage testing here. Now, deriving these prime paths as an algorithm behind it, as you might expect. You don't just have to rely on eyeballing it. But there's an iterative algorithm that you follow that will, in fact, generate these prime paths. It, basically speaking, there's three components to this algorithm. One of them is trivial, just the initial sort of setup, initialize. Okay. Secondly, you're going to loop through and you're going to successively extend things, kind of growing these chains. And during that middle part, you're basically separating things into two pieces. You're going to increasingly be accumulating a thing called PP, which is the, the set of candidates for prime paths. And then the residual ones are going to be going to continue for further extending. Okay? So each round of this algorithm, as we see, we're going to take some of the things we've got that can't be extended, and those are going to be our candidates for prime paths. And each round through, we're going to be extracting those. Just like that. These other ones, the EPs, those are going to be the things that we can end up extending. And we're going to be examining the, extending them in the next round. We're going, to be, we're going to be going and sort of further processing them and separating them out in the next round. So it's like we're turning the crank. Each time through, we're turning the crank. We got some things coming out that are candidates for, for being prime paths, and we've got some things which just need to be handled to the next row, okay? And, and, and handled further. And then finally, the third round, I'm just giving an overview. We'll talk about the specifics of this in a minute. The, third, the final phase basically takes the things that are candidates for prime paths, the set called PP, and we're going to discard from any of those, those that are proper subpaths of others. So it's sort of saying, okay, get rid of the ones that are already contained in the others and winnow it down to a set that are where there's no two of them. And there's no two A and B where A is a is a um, is a uh, proper super path. It, it contains B. Okay, those are the three phases of the algorithm. Let's let's talk through this. So what's going on in this algorithm? Well. Basically, the thing that we're going to be extending every time is this piece of i, which are paths of length i. We're going to start with that just being p1. It's going to be things of length 1, which are basically all the nodes. So we're going to start with all the nodes of p1, hmm? all the nodes of our graph in p1. And then we're going to set i to b1. Remember, we've got things of length 1. Each round of this algorithm we're going through start from length 1. Going to length two, going to length three, successively enlarging it. And so I initially is one. We're just dealing with things of length one. PP, ladies and gentlemen, sort of the candidates to be prime paths, that's empty right now. Okay. We don't have any candidates yet. No candidates yet. Okay. So we're gonna get into this to the to now the loop 
each iteration. So each iteration of the loop, this is what we're going to do. First, we're going to check, is p sub i empty? If we have nothing to extend of length i, we're done. We're gonna, well, we're done with, with this phase. We're going to go on to the third phase of the algorithm. We're going to sort, sort out what we already got. OK, if, if we do have some things here of length i, I'm going to get ready to separate them out by, by having here a um, uh, p sub i plus 1 that we're going to be putting things into that are blank i plus 1. Okay, So the basic deal here is we're going to take these things in p sub i, these things we have a blank i, and we are going to basically separate them into two bounds, two, two categories, things that are ready to be considered prime paths or not. Okay, um, So here, we're going to do that by distinguishing a, a, a class called R. Okay? These are the subset of, I, of P sub I that are either cycles or can't be extended further um, at, the, at their end because they end at the terminal node. There's nowhere for them to go. Now, the key thing to realize about this, why, why are we picking this subset of P sub i out, these ones that are cycles or can't be extended forward because of the end of terminal nodes? What, what are the two things that distinguish that? The fact that they're cycles and the fact that they end in the terminal node, why is it, why is it that those are sort of share a certain characteristic from the point of view of a prime path? If something's a prime, if something's a cycle, it's, it, it goes back to the same node at which it started. If we extend it, why is that a problem? And it's no longer a prime path, right? If it ends at a terminal node, we, we can't extend it. There's nowhere for it to go, right? There's no later node. So we can't extend it there either. So both of these, both these things, these things that start and end at the same place, or those that get to go to the terminal node, those are candidates for being prime paths, it turns out. As long as they're not included in another prime path. Gosh, if we extended it, it wouldn't even be a simple path, right? Right? Remember these simple paths are ones that that can't have repetition except A equals B. So so these are simple paths that right now, but if we extend them, they won't be a simple path, right? Hmm? So we're going to take them, and we're going to put them into the candidates for prime paths. Because we know they're simple paths. And if they're not a subpath of another one, then they're what? Prime paths. And so this third phase is going to be dealing with the prime path is one of it's not a subset of any other prime path, right? Um, okay, so that's what R is going to give us. R is going to give us the set that that can't be extended without violating the rules of, of simple paths here. And so, if if we're, if some of the paths are in that situation, we put them in prime, this PP bit. They're candidates for prime paths. They're not necessarily prime paths, but they're candidates. After all, they might still be a subset, but not the one, in which case they're not a prime path. Okay, so let's continue on here. So that's the group we're putting in one bin. The other bin we got is this thing called EP, the extensible paths within P sub i. These are the ones that, that can be extended without violating them as, as a simple path, okay? Um, and for each path, EP, in EP, for each of these extensible paths, each of these ones that can be extended, not a cycle, it doesn't end with the terminal node. For each of them, what we're going to do is we're going to find each possible extension for them, this node N, to which it can be extended. Maybe it has multiple you know, paths out of it, multiple transitions out, and for each of those, um, we're basically going to be 
having a criteria here where we're going to say um, if that n does complete that cycle back to the beginning, or if it's not in there already at all, in other words, if we can do that and still keep it a simple path, we're going to put that extension to this p, this p that's in extensible paths, we're going to put that extension into p of i sub 1, p sub i sub 1. Because already p is of length i, and when we add this one onto it, it's of length what? i plus 1. That's why we're putting it to p sub i plus 1. We're putting it into this set of things that are simple paths of length i plus 1. Okay? Um, in this criteria, make sure we're not violating it being a simple path. This criteria here. Okay? Um, so we're going to put it into there. We're going to append it onto p and stick it in there for each of those. Which is the way it's going to be so p sub i sub 1 will be a thing of length i plus 1. Things of length that, that are i plus 1. And, and they are simple paths. Um, there are no cases where the things in there have repetition, uh, except that the a equals b. And it, they don't have repetition except where a equals b. Um, and then we increment i. And we go on to the next round. So each round through, we've got things of length i. We're separating into two bins. Things that are could be their maximum length simple paths, and they could be prime paths. And things that are able to be extended, therefore they're not maximal length, we're able to extend them. And we extend them in a way that will keep them a simple path and, and, and save those for the next round. So we keep on extending, extend, 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 until they're as big as they could be while still being simple paths. And for those, we're going to the third round, right? So each come round, crank, crank, crank. We've got some coming out that are ready for candidacy for prime paths and some that can still be extended and extended legitimately and therefore would be would be um, uh, candidates for, for they're, they're not yet maximal length simple pass. This final round, we discard from PP any any elements from the prime pass, any elements that are subsets of others. Okay? So I've given an example here, which I'm not gonna have time to go over, but I'd ask you to review it uh, on your own. But it's going through each round of this algorithm. We're successively extending. At first, we start with the nodes. So length two, we're extending. And each time, we're separating them out. The things that are uh, exclamation points or stars, those are things that can't be extended and therefore get put, put aside for considerate as possible prime paths. Um, and then I give a set of paths through at the end that will that will include all of all of these um, all of the prime paths. Okay, um, so there's going to be a set of prime paths that are successively um, extracted. So uh, that's uh, that's all for today. We've covered prime paths and a bit of a review of the other ones. I'd like you to go uh, to go through that. Okay, and. Uh, I'd like you to review those next two slides, okay? Good. That's all we'll have up to this point.